joining. Um, we're very conscious that everyone is tired of Zooms and, and webinars and meetings and everything else. So the, we have content uh, to talk about what we see in the world of blockchain from our perspective. However, we want this to be a conversation. Clearly, the, the few of you joined for the purpose of learning something. So if there's anything you're curious about, anything you want to know, which we might have an answer to or which we can follow up on, just either speak up or put on chat um, and, and we're going to address it to best of our ability. Um, so my, my name is Lukas Staniszewski and I've been in this space for the last uh, three years, uh, spearheading the product development practice in IBM, uh, largely focused on um, working with the open source community around Hyperledger Fabric, but most importantly, uh, developing IBM's blockchain uh, portfolio of products, which includes IBM and blockchain platform and such. Uh, I'm joined by Porter Stowell. Uh, Porter, do you want to do a quick intro of who you are and what you do? Sure thing, Lucas. Great to be here. Thanks, Marta, for the introduction. Uh, I, Lucas and I have been partners in crime now with IBM Blockchain Platform for, what, two years now? Two years. Yeah. I, I've been with IBM Blockchain Platform along with Alan Dickinson, who's on the call for for three years. And, you know, I'm, I'm also an offering manager with Lucas and we cover slightly different aspects of how do we bring our product to market. But I, uh, on a more personal note, I live in North Carolina at uh, Research Triangle Park, which is IBM, one of IBM's larger blockchain hubs. Lucas is at the other one in New York City. Uh, we also have hubs in Hursley, uh, UK, um, and other places around the gold globe. So with, you know, again, uh, to echo previous points, we're gonna make this a conversation with ourselves and we encourage you all to jump in uh, at any point, but uh, excited to be here today and talk some blockchain. Cool, thanks, Porter. So let me, let me just outline wh what we came to discuss, um, but again, we're flexible. So we'll start off with some high level trends of what we see in the market based on our conversations with clients, analysts and such. And, and for those of you who are maybe not familiar with what we do, uh, IBM has been in this space for, uh, for a very long time. We'll, we'll speak a little bit about the history, but we were one of the, the initial contributors to Hyperledger Fabric. We actually contributed the code, which then originated to be Fabric. And we've been very active in the community. Um, since then, we've had literally hundreds of, of clients working on our products, um, and we've seen a lot in this market. So we're going to share a little bit of the latest trends and some high-level industry-specific things we're seeing. And, and then at the end of the day, blockchain is just the underlying technology, which you all know, and it, it's exciting to know and see what is happening on the industry level from a use case perspective. So we, we've picked a few use cases which we believe are relevant to the world we live in or that are re relevant from a perspective of what is actually scaling in this, in this market. And then we'll pivot more towards the actual underlying technology. And, and we're here to, to tell you a little bit about how we can help you, how we build a set of products which can help you in actually addressing the business case and the end value. And then we're going to have a conversation about what we are thinking about in 2021 and beyond and what are the, the underlying, the technological things that we have to focus on? And that's gonna be the most open uh, and, and we're just gonna have a conversation. We hope that you're gonna post some questions so that we can tackle them as we go. And the objective today is one, show us how we can help you. And two, if any one of you is, is interested in a one-on-one -on -one conversation is to ultimately come to us and, and, and have a chat about all things blockchain. So with that said, let's start off with some observations. Go ahead, Border. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Uh, you know, it's hard to talk about the market today without covering COVID in some way, shape, or form. I know we're all probably, you know, exhausted from talking about COVID, but this has had a dramatic uh, impact on the blockchain market, specifically enterprise blockchain, both good and bad. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, overall investment with blockchain decrease dramatically because of the pandemic. We see forecasts for 2021 cut across the board. And the reason for this is a lot of the key industries that we're looking in, into blockchain just aren't a position to invest in innovation like they were. 
construction, consumer services, transportation, media, retail. I mean, these were some of our most promising clients and you know they're facing larger challenges at the moment. So you can see how it's difficult to put enterprise blockchain as a priority. Uh, you know, and with economic uncertainty becomes tighter innovation budgets, tighter budgets across the board. Until we get some level of stability and clarity, I can empathize with any C CIO, CTO, like how do you allocate your budget and where do you invest your limited resources in this time of uncertainty? It, it's a really challenging environment on there. But with all that being said, because of COVID, it's really kicked blockchain, enterprise blockchain up, up a level in a degree. So there's uh, the notion of we need more immutability in these time, in times of uncertainty now more than ever. And so this is really driving increased blockchain spend. And you can see that just since July, you know, from June one year to July this year, conversations were up 50, uh, 54% in such a short period of time. And that's because of the immutability, the centralized nature that enterprise blockchain touches Very upon. Good, uh -huh. I'm sorry? Okay, uh, probably just a mute. Um, so th this makes a lot of sense and is encouraging. Uh, you know, from all chaos comes opportunity. And it's great to see that blockchain and enterprise blockchain is, is kind of tap, uh, opportuni opportunistically capitalizing on this chaos. And with that, you know, obviously healthcare comes to the forefront. We're seeing a lot of blockchain related COVID response cases, and we see healthcare really upping their investment and interest in all things enterprise blockchain. And with that, we'll, we'll also touch on some use cases in supply chain resiliency, you know, COVID has shown us from a firsthand experience that new vendors need to be onboarded quickly. Uh, and having a flexible and rapid supply chain uh, is of paramount importance in these times of uncertainty. So we're seeing a lot of inv exciting investment there as well. You wanna go on to the next slide, Lucas? And, and the data is showing this out. So just from doing some basic social listening, you can see industries such as financial services, healthcare, and industrial are really ramping up their interest in, in uh, mentions of blockchain. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we see uh, volume in blockchain marketplace has jumped by more than 36% from 600, you know, 675,000 in June to 920,000 plus in July. You know, we're, we're across the board from social to other metrics we're seeing an increase in activity specific to industries that have a vested interest in trust and transparency. And you know, we continue to see this trend in the data as well. And, and you know, there's still a large conversation about permission versus permissionless. And right now we're seeing adoption on both sides of the fence. And you know, it's not to say one is better than the other at this point, I think what the more important lesson here is, is that we need both, uh, both to be successful. A rising tide lifts all boats. And over time, we will work to increase interoperability between these two spheres of our world at this moment. But when you see large businesses deepening their investment in enterprise blockchain and permission blockchain, this is a great thing. Same with permissionless. It's great to see the Ernst and Youngs and Coca Colas of the world investing in permissionless as well. This is only going to bring more attention to the industry, create more opportunities, and eventually we'll get to a point of increased interoperability, where you know blockchain can really deliver on the promise it's always sent out to deliver. So you know I don't want to read too you know it's not about picking a winner or a loser at this point. Again, it's, I still think we're in a period of learning trial and error and getting more and more applications into a production uh, state and seeing, let people see firsthand the value that distributed ledger technology can bring to their organizations and ecosystems. And, and just to add to this, like we've all probably heard about the PayPal announcements in October 
Um, and and the fact that in, in this week, they said that they're going to drop the wait list. And if you think about like this, the significance of what PayPal is doing with the hundreds of millions of users they have and, and the tens of millions of merchants they have to buy, hold, store and use crypto, we've seen a, a, a huge spike in in revisiting blockchain conversations with our clients. Because at this point, if PayPal is, is putting a huge bet on this, if JP Morgan is, is creating its standalone blockchain unit within its enterprise with 100 people, some of the biggest skeptics from two years ago, and they were the skeptics, are revisiting and putting a lot of money on, on, the, on this horse. So for all of us on this call, this is good because we are again seeing, as Porto said, uh, a tide which lifts all of us. And we'll talk about how this all correlates together and how, how we see it working together. Anyway, back to you, Porter. Yeah, and personally, I think, you know, as Bitcoin continues to surge to new all-time highs or close to it, I think this is also good for enterprise blockchain as well. It, it drags the conversation uh, and puts it on the forefront of more people's brains and all conversations are going to be productive at this point. You know, with all that being said of permission, permissionless, we continue to see that Hyperledger Fabric is the number one permission DLT. And, you know, it's from the, you look at the developer community, uh, who from a technology vendor perspective is supporting protocols with active engagements and what the large companies are doing and where they're going into production grade. Uh, we continue to see Hyperledger Fabric as the leader in this space. Uh, it's got the most mature ecosystem and, you know, we, we constantly get reaffirmation from all the sources and customers that we speak with that it, it, is, a def it is the default standard for enterprise blockchain. Uh, and, you know, it, it's great that permissionless is getting steam and there's, uh, there's absolutely some great use cases there. But for what businesses we see businesses trying to accomplish today from a value standpoint, we continue to see Hyperledger Fabric being the de facto uh, DLT of choice. So, you know, we covered a lot of ground. We, we said we want to make this conversational. Any questions about the research or state of the market to date that people will either want to contribute to or have questions about? I'll start. Um, so what, what is your opinion uh, I hear a lot of people, more and more actually, people saying, well, all of this permission stuff, that's, that's great, but I think that ultimately we'll end up with public blockchains only. This is like the middle stage of, um, of development. So uh, that could be. However, the clients that we're working with, a lot of them are, you know, we work with a lot of financial institutions. And you know they they protect their data. Uh, they have compliance issues. You know all this. You know a slew of compliance issues that I can't even begin to under begin to understand or and how that impacts what they do on a blockchain from a blockchain perspective. They're looking to create very you know discrete conversations and data sharing about what they're doing and how they're transacting with other organizations within that ecosystem. For, the, for that specific example, you know, they have very high levels of security uh, and regulatory issues from data privacy, data residency, and they need to know absolutely who they're transacting with. Now, could they somehow post that to a public network? Perhaps, but you, know, you need the security and privacy that they're currently not seeing within specific use cases. Let me add two, two points to that. So, so one uh, uh, case in point from our perspective that we see adoption in the future, but there's a lot of different hurdles that companies will face. Like if you think about participating in any public blockchain, it doesn't matter whether it's Ethereum, Hedera or anything else, suddenly the company has to go into the custody of these assets, tokens and such. And that becomes a problematic uh, accounting and finance problem because it's difficult to account for uh, the value of these. Is it an expense? Is it an asset? 
who has permissions, where is it stored? So this is a new concept. It's not necessarily a tricky concept, but it's a new concept. And many companies are simply not fit for that. But that's like a tactical reason. I'd say the bigger reason is, is one which is very relevant to the discourse of today's world, which is a lot of people say, why wouldn't elections and voting be done on blockchains? And the majority of us say, yeah, that's a brilliant case. But it becomes a little bit more tricky because uh, if you suddenly allow yourself to run um, extremely important operations, be it in the public or private sector, you are now vulnerable to that system. So you are vulnerable to denial of attacks and, and any other thing. And you are dependent on the underlying layer. There, the layer is not yet mature enough to address cases which are very vulnerable in terms of security and such. Um, and there's a lot of things which are unknown. So I think companies today are still in a proof of concept and pilot mode to test these, but to move a production system where you have sensitive data um, and data that you cannot expose, I don't think the technology is there yet. It will be there eventually. So long story short to your question, as blockchain purists or blockchain uh, bulls, we believe that this, the web 3.0 is an area which will change the world we live in. Now it's gonna take time and some cases will need a closed ecosystem which will be done through permission. Others will benefit from open. So the, the, the future is very much about how do these coexist in the same way as how the web coexists with different, right. uh, different underlying technologies. It, Sorry, lo it, long answer. And eventually it's not going to be a binary choice. It's going to be, you'll be able to self-select where you fall on the permission versus permissionless spectrum. Yeah. At least hopefully. Yeah. But again, to Lucas's point, it's gonna take some time to get there. Mm -hmm. yeah. hi, hi, Lucas and Porter, I've got a question. Um, do you see um, a problem with um, the adoption due to a number of organizations having to, uh, um, to, so for example, you may start off with an organization, but then everyone needs to be part of this consortium in order to be able to have that adoption. Do you see any blockers or issues there? So that's that's a that's like the the crux of the enterprise um, network formation question. So there's a, a few subsets of your question, which is how do you incentivize people to join a network? People being organizations, if they have limited benefits, uh, tangible benefits, um, and how do you solve for that? So there's a number of things we've observed in the market. One is that if you're a market monopoly you demand that clients or partners onboard to a network because of the benefit they will receive of being a supplier. That's, that's one, and that's kind of a, not a long-term solution. What we're seeing more and more of is that the, it's important to distinguish what does it mean to be a member of a network from a technological perspective, like owning a node, owning a peer, owning whatever the construct is in, 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 in the protocol you're working on in, in high budget fabric, do you need a peer node? Do you need to have access to the ledger? Do you need to be endorsing transactions or do you need to participate in consensus? And what we're seeing over time is that, especially around the consensus level, if you're building a private network, you, you not everyone needs to be the one participating in running the transactions through the consensus, so that's one. The second then becomes more tricky around who from the organizational level needs to own a node with access directly to the ledger endorsed transactions. Initially, we thought that every organization would need that and benefit from that. But to your point, we're seeing that it becomes a massive burden because if you're a small partner, a small company, going through the whole process of setting up the infrastructure, having the, the, the knowledge to build that out and actually the cost incurred becomes prohibitive. So if we look at the topology of the growth of our networks, we're seeing very few which are adding many, many nodes. What we see actually happening is companies working more on the application layer. So you don't need to own an individual node yourself. You're participating either in a community, a shared node in which you have like given restricted access and permissions. And that reduces the cost. It reduces the burden of a member company actually going into the details of blockchain. And that's like the big, big, big topic. 
we should abstract away from the blockchain conversation at some point and focus on the application layer because you're there to get data visibility to get whatever you need to get in your in your solution so long answer but the point is there are new models from a network topology perspective which are far more suited than we believed two years ago porter how would you how would you add to this yeah and it's i i see the networks that are successful have a structured approach to onboarding new members and like that governance model and with that it's tied to the value proposition that that their application is looking to create. And what I see is the more laser focused you have on your use case and the, the specific problem you're solving, it makes, it is the oil in the car that makes it all run. That's what gets people through your governance process. Uh, and I think, you know, if I were to look forward and, you know, this is teasing out a subject we'll cover later, it's how do you, you help people with governance models uh, so they can be successful. Because that, that is the tricky part. There's the business, there's the legal and the technology aspect, the BLT of blockchain. And you know the business has come a long way. The technology has come a long way. In any blockchain conversation, it's rarely the technology that is the sticking point for adoption and proliferation. Uh, it is the, the legal, which kind of includes the governance structures. So, you know, hopefully there will be a lot more work done there, creating more standardized, standard processes for anyone and everyone to follow uh, so they can get, you know, focusing on the business logic and problem that they're actually so trying to solve. James, we gave you a very long answer to your question. Uh, did we even, <laughs> we're, we're did trying we even to answer time. your question? Yeah. No, no, thank you for that. Um, I, I, um, I ask, I've got a couple of use cases and I don't want to take any much more of your time. Um, is there any way I can get in contact or with you guys directly yeah. to kind of go through that? Um, I kind of work for a consultancy which are looking into um, blockchain at the moment. So um, what is the best way of getting in contact with yourselves? Well, I'll post our emails here and like anyone on this call can just reach out to us and we'll schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. So I'll post both of our emails and just ping us both. Yeah, Thank you. everyone on the call gets the, the special treatment, the VIP treatment, so. <laughs> so I <laughs> I see Bharat, Bharat, gosh, I'm so sorry, uh, Bharat uh, Kumar raising uh, his hand. Uh, so I, I'm, I let you talk now, so you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi, sir. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, is it possible to create a decentralization for the videos or the any content one using the hyperledger? So what are you, you're trying to video, put up oh, for the videos, videos a blockchain? pictures, yeah. No, uh, when, when we take a YouTube videos, so I can create a platform for that. So I can upload videos in my platform. Is it possible to create a decentralization using the hyperledger? Uh, uh, yes, um, I'd be curious, you know, I think the tricky part is, it's just like, what are you storing on the ledger and you know, what, what aspect I mean, is decentralized, okay. but uh, I th you, put, it, you can always put, put something on the, uh, on the hyperledger fabric for sure. So uh, I think the general answer here is, uh, you can use distributed ledger and hyperledger fabric for almost any use case you can come up with. Uh, it is a technology just like your, you know, databases, artificial intelligence, cloud, and so on and so forth. So can you use a technology to build a decentralized uh, media platform, uh, sh sharing platform? Yes. Now, question is, what exactly do you want to decentralize and what's your, um, what's your um use case specifically what why are you needing a blockchain uh but i think that's kind of dives deep into that specific uh, use case that you have so i think it will be great if uh, you can follow okay, up I, I, afterwards i can use directly on the videos or the content of the video um well yes you can put a video on a blockchain it probably mm -hmm. doesn't make much sense but you theoretically could do it yeah, okay, thank you. 
So, you know, I worked with one client who does video distribution uh, and why they were using blockchain as an example was, you know, I, I don't know where everyone lives, but in the US, like we get, we consume most of our video, con like our movie content through Netflix and Hulu and these services. But when you go to an international market, the distributors or wholesalers of those videos, it's very hard to track and trace who has rights to what video and for how long and through what outlet. And it's like, it becomes a distributed network of trying to figure out who has your content into what markets. So there was a startup that was looking at using blockchain to facilitate and solve the problem that is uh, international video distribution or movie title distribution. And you know that works really well for some of these you know non-marquee titles like independent films, for example. Like, how do you put these into markets in a secure way that you can a know who has rights to it and for how long, how many views it's getting, uh, and everyone from the movie producer to the to the distributor to the consumer has transparency uh, as to how any specific title is performing. So, you know, when you look at an international, you know, television market, you know, that is a diverse uh, network of participants and you're trying to aggregate that information across, you know, different user bases. So you're getting, you know, who's consuming the video, who has rights to the video um, and how, you know, all other financial performance metrics that are associated with that video distribution and consumption. So, so Potter, yeah. let's 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 move on. Let's let's give our view on like what we know are the cases that are growing. Um, it feels that we could have had a conversation about sometimes your presentation is this a blockchain use case or is this not? We won't go down that path. Uh, but let's talk about what we think is 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 exciting. What we don't think is exciting, we can skip this uh, yeah. and talk about you know the impact. Yeah. So you know this is we as Lucas mentioned before, we've been in blockchain for a long time now. And we've grown at a very exciting customer base that we're proud of. These are our production clients doing real things in blockchain. And you know, while we, we're not going to dive into every single one of the examples, we just want to highlight some of the key, like how these, some of these solutions have emer evolved over time. So within IBM, one of our marquee solutions is IBM Food Trust. So you can see that you know, since its inception, we have over 200 clients. We passed the 28 million transaction mark, and we have 20,000 products uh, currently using the Food Trust solution. If you look at WeTrade, WeTrade is a trade finance solution. Uh, it's got 16 of the largest banks uh, across 15 countries in Europe, and it's you know it's got uh, 60 million euro value of transactions. So they're they're putting real uh, business value through this network. And it's facilitating the speed of business, as I like to say, um, you know, with major players and their, e their vendor ecosystem uh, within Europe. And BCI out of Thailand, you know, this is the world's first blockchain based platform for government savings bonds and issuing a total of $1.6 billion worth of US, you know, in US dollar terms within its first couple of years, uh, within the first two weeks of going into true production. And you know, we'll cover that a little bit more, uh, exactly what BCI is doing from a use case perspective on why it's so unique. But you know, all these companies are evolving. And you know, if, when we talk to analysts, uh, one of the common things we hear about enterprise blockchain is it's in the trough of disillusionment. So you have your initial hype cycle, which kind of peaked out in 2018 with the, you know, in sync with, Bitcoin 20,000, but since then we've, we've really gone down into the trough and what that has done is it's weeded out the pretenders. Um, and what's left are organizations who have a very specific business problem that they're trying to solve and blockchain is just the technology that's helping them address that issue. They're not doing blockchain for the sake of blockchain. And you know, what do these customers have in common? Uh, you know, we've, we've touched on it multiple times, so I'll do this quickly. Uh, you know, the, there's an existing business network. Those 
companies that have to create an ecosystem really are struggling. But those who already had an ecosystem in place that they can tap into with this value added offering are doing much better. Secondly, they have a real problem uh, that they, they've been examining how they conduct business today, and that there's some sort of friction, whether per perceived or uh, real, that uh, incurs you know, unnecessary costs or time delays. And there's an unsatisfied need for trust. Uh, and what does that mean? I, you know, one of the common things, or one of my favorite revelations in my three years of blockchain at IBM is the notion is, it's not that trust doesn't exist, it's that trust can be enhanced by blockchain. And what is the value of enhancing that trust? For them, a lot of times it means, you know, a massive reduction in cost or time and efficiency. And there's still a whole suite of revenue innovations that we really haven't even scratched the surface of. But it's, it's really challenging ourselves to think of what could I do in my business world with enhanced trust? But these are the three ingredients that we commonly see. Uh, and, and you know, with that, the other thing that we see in common from all of our customers is that they're using our platform as a key part of their blockchain strategy. They're, you know, we, you know, we're building off of Hyperledger Fabric to make it easier and simpler for that people to build, operate, and grow their, their blockchain networks, uh, whether it's in a SaaS or software deployment model. And you know, this is the foundation that people are building their applications on, on top of. Uh, and we're going to go through the examples of what some of our customers are able to accomplish because you know, we take a lot of the heavy lifting out of blockchain because this gets really complicated when you look at some of our production grade clients, what they're trying to accomplish uh, and the size of their, their networks, we're making, we're streamlining that process for them so they can focus on the business value they're trying to create. So, you know, we wanted to highlight some of our favorite use cases uh, and, you know, highlight the common use case as well. So one of the common use cases we're getting is just track and trace capabilities within blockchain. So straight provenance of you know, where, where goods have come from and where they're going. Uh, you know, we've talked about food trust. Uh, this is a great example of you know, food traceability and supply chain visibility, uh, which started with a great story out of Walmart where Walmart went to a team of people and said, uh, tell me the origins of, these, of this mango. And it took the team about six day, 10 people six days uh, to locate exactly which farm those ma mangoes came from. And since that, uh, since operating on the blockchain, now that same query takes about two seconds. So you can see the transparency that provides, it, you know, it's solving a real issue for customers. And again, you could, you could absolutely understand why trust within the food supply chain is of utmost importance to someone's brand and customer satisfaction. Now within food trust, they've cr now created, we've now created something called BTS, which you, you get all the same capabilities of track and trace that food trust provides, but is agnostic to most any use case. So it's a great way for shortcutting development so you don't have to recreate the wheel uh, if you wanna do something track and trace related that mimics the food trust solution. Now, Everledger is another example where they're trying to provide authenticity, uh, traceability and provenance around things like wine, diamonds, olive oil, these commodity products that are really hard to determine their source of origin. Uh, Everledger is another one of our clients working with this type of application and you know, making great progress. Let's keep going. Letters yeah, of sorry, I want. Sorry, I was, I was, uh, I wanted to add something. Um, yeah, go ahead. We're, 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 the purpose of what we're doing now is to give you a glimpse of literally networks which um, are making a real world impact. So this is not hand-selected POCs which have been with us for three months. Those are actual real networks. But how does that relate to you? Uh, one thing which you can take away is that for the majority of the use case we're speaking about, so we're going to speak about procurement, we're going to speak about letters of guarantee and track and trace, 
we've built so-called code samples. So for you to, rather than rebuild an existing solution, there's a number of paths you can take. You can join a network and learn from that network as a member, or you can replicate the model which they're doing in perhaps a different industry, perhaps a different market. So we will share the assets with you at the end, but we have a whole repository of, of samples that can kickstart your journey very quickly to address any of these use cases. So again, on our website, in the links we'll share, uh, if any one of these interests you, you can learn about them, join them, or build your own. Sorry, Potter. Yeah, and you know, letters of guarantee, it's like, I never knew this was such a problem, but like, if you want a guarantee to, like it takes over a month in Australia to get that type of issuance, uh, and it's paper-based process. And now with, you know, with, with blockchain, you can get that issuance within under, under a day. This is, you know, again, facilitating the speed of business. And it's, it's a real powerful use case in trade finance. And we're seeing it like people are really jumping on it because it, it provides a ton of value for people uh, looking to have that level of assurance with who they're, who they're dealing with and can they finance certain uh, aspects of, of trading. Procurement is one of my favorite use cases, mostly because you know I've worked at IBM for almost eight years. And if you've ever had to onboard a new supplier or vendor into our ecosystem, it is a painstaking process uh, with zero visibility. So I love the procurement solutions that are probably my personal favorite. And what it does is it's ex expedites the process because now by joining a, one of these networks as a supplier, your, your path to verification and ability to work with other vendors and customers within that network you know, is decreased by 90%. So yes, you still have some custom work to do, but for the vast majority of these examples, your time to market is you know, way less and it's a much more structured process. You know, so you think of something like COVID, all of a sudden, you know, people needed to get you know, ventilators from suppliers that they had, hadn't traditionally worked with before. Like think of Ford Motor Company started producing ventilators within the first couple of weeks uh, as other vendors as well came into the market to provide this equipment, but yet <clears throat> they're not in your traditional customer database or vendor database. So how can you get them included <clears throat> and get their, make sure their product is trusted and you know, supporting the market. And same with trust your supplier. This is a faster way to get onboarded and dealing with customers. I, I kind of like it as the face, the MySpace of uh, su supply chain vendors where it's literally join the market and let people find you and onboard to more quickly and easily uh, find new vendors to work with. And within the COVID space, uh, I think one of the more exciting developments has been on digital health pass. And what this is, is how do you, how do you enable this economy to get up and running again? I have a friend who you know, manages a theater here in North Carolina where they have Broadway shows, musical acts, and they have no pathway forward to safely and securely opening up those venues. Like they, their only path forward for revenue viability is to have people inside. So di is digital health, health paths can support, you know, entertainment venues, workplaces on providing some level of assurance on who is walking into those facilities, making sure that they've been tested uh, and that, you know, these encrypted digital wallets that have your certification that you have some sort of COVID response or test uh, that is valid for a specific uh, duration of time. You know, can this allow the economy to reopen in a healthy way, in a private secure way that no PII or health data is, uh, or metadata is obtained from your health records? But it, it's a really great and difficult question that involves credentialing and blockchain uh, and permission blockchain uh, that we're seeing, you know, across IBM today. So let's pause here. Go ahead, exactly. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, my question really was um, some of the uh, things that you're talking about are very heavy on identity. Uh, obviously, 
in Hyperledger, we have many kids and we love them all equally. So uh, we have also Hyperledger Indie. And I was wondering if within uh, your organization or your project, have you been um, experimenting with uh, interoperability between, uh, say, Hyperledger Indie and Hyperledger Fabric? So, um, so a few answers. So yeah, there's in the areas or side, it, it seems that there's quite a few uh, opening up in that space. So we have uh, an organization which has been working on indie on indie for quite a while. And it's more so to address the identity case from a pure perspective. So we have a, a number of security and, and identity management solutions, which are built on, on Indy. Uh, now from an interoperability perspective, it's interesting you say so. We we spoke yesterday with Arnola Ors, which is uh, our representative on the on the technical steering committee, and he he urged us to look more closely into this. We haven't done anything per se. We have looked, uh, but interop is a, is a broad, as you know, concept in of itself. Um, and many different definitions. So we'll speak about a number of them because you know there is interop or leveraging indie as a framework but there is also interop with other frameworks be it within your family like Besu, or it's outside of our family such as uh, pure ethereum or, or or else so i hate giving indirect answers we don't have anything today uh, we're looking at how to leverage this because it becomes clear per my comments about voting per the comments about these solutions that identity will play a key role and just building an identity or a certificate or a CA or an MSP on each individual network doesn't make sense. Uh, a year ago, we were very bullish on the notion of networks of networks. Like some of our Fortune 500 clients are working on 10 different use cases in supply chain, trade finance, procurement, and so forth. And as it stands, they're building 10 different networks. That, that is unsustainable. So the, I, the central identity will play a key role, be it on an individual or organizational or functional level. So now I will shut up and let perhaps Porter augment my well, answer. I was just looking at the clock, Lucas, and we don't have that much time left. So I, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to you and chime in with comments. Okay, so we have 15 minutes, I'm gonna, try and, and give you a reason for why you should come and try our platform and everything else say you can do for free. So let's start off with what is it that we do? So IBM, as you all probably think is this massive company which does everything and anything, but we also focus very much on, on the whole notion of how can we abstract away and build a solution which lets you focus on the end value. So we've developed the so-called IBM blockchain platform and a portfolio of tools. What we, what the platform is, is I'm gonna explain in more detail, but it's, it's an environment in which you can manage your networks, you can grow your networks and you can manage everything to do from an operational level. Everything is built on Hyperledger fabric and our platform can run on any underlying environment as long as it is Kubernetes. So a lot of people think IBM blockchain platform, IBM cloud. No, you can use IBM blockchain platform on whichever cloud you wanna deploy it to. So let me give you a few reasons for why you should reach out to us for a follow-up or why you should click on our marketing pages and go and do a 30 day trial. So one, uh, as you probably can tell, we've been in this space for a long time and we have consistently been argued to be the number one player in this space because of our involvement in the community. Join any Hyperledger meetup, join any, any webinar and you'll see, go to the GitHub pages, go to the community, you'll see our active contribution. And this tacit knowledge which we have uh, correlates to how we know this product and we know this industry. So we're ultimately this one throat to choke. If you wanna do blockchain, we can give you uh, the people and the expertise. And, and this is evident in, how quickly we adopt open source versions in our product. This is a very tricky thing because Fabric, specifically Fabric, I'm speaking to Fabric, has a quarterly cadence on average to release the, the next version with the next capabilities. Now, from a software development perspective, from a commercial platform like ours, it takes time to adopt the features, build the tooling on top and such. But as you can see in this chart, we've done 
like the adoption of the open source version within 30 days if it's a minor version and within a quarter if it's a major release like Fabric 2.0. So you can rest assured that if you were to look for someone with a platform which has the latest features, we do uh, support these very quickly. Now, I've mentioned this early, but let's conceptualize it a little bit. So of course you can take open source fabric and you can deploy it anywhere, but as probably many of you know, it becomes a complex operation. If you have a network with a hundred organizations with tens of thousands of, of channels, uh, it becomes very difficult if you don't have a management console. So our console lets the users both one deploy where you want to deploy, like I said, but also manage all these different node deployments. So your members will be running in many different places in one central place. And this, this matters because blockchain should not restrict anyone. The point of blockchain is to include everyone from a perspective of a network. So if you're now saying that you can only run in one environment or something else, you're limiting your options. So what we're saying here, deploy it anywhere, connect your nodes in one central place. I mentioned the tooling, like the tooling is literally the, the bread and butter of what we do and the, and the, and the, and the big chunk of our work. Um, I'll give a few hypothetical examples, but managing permissions of hundreds of members requires changes to endorsement policies and changes within the member permissions and such. Doing this on an individual level becomes extremely time sensitive. Uh, onboarding new members through Fabric, we've done some tests if you were to do it open source without any tooling yourself, it takes hours. And then if you go into products in which you should focus on onboarding a member quickly for the discussion we had with James, uh, we, we allow you to do it in a few minutes. So the point is that our platform has been built in a way to abstract away all these things which are not value additive for you, but are essential for your network growth. This is a key point. So I'm gonna conceptualize it first. The enterprise permissioned space has been criticized that it is not decentralized and distributed. That has been a, a hallmark criticism for the last few years. So the argument is consensus is run by one company. Chain code or smart contracts are written one by one company. And you cannot run the solution in many different environments. That is a myth. The truth is that with the technologies in Fabric and the technologies we provide, you can connect your nodes running anywhere. Any organization can participate and run consensus, any and all within your network. Of course, it becomes more challenging and tricky, but you can do it. And with the latest version of Fabric, we allow companies to come together and write their smart contracts and, and, and agree on the smart contracts together. So the point is, both on the Fabric, but also on our level, we've built the tools which allow you to build this ultimate flexibility and decentralization as much as you need it to be so. Um, Tools, I mentioned the platform tool per se, but that's not it, that's not it, that's not everything. So you can manage your nodes, but you need to do everything around it as well. So I mentioned code patterns before. So we have a repository of assets which can kickstart your development time from a use case perspective. We also have an extension to VS Code, uh, the, the Microsoft IDE platform in which we let you write debug and, smart, and test your smart contracts. So that is a separate environment in the environment which our developers prefer. So you can go again for free, go and write and test that. And we've recently focused on automation because when you scale, when you get into production, adding many members, doing operations at scale requires automation. We've done that, that through the so-called Ansible playbooks. Very quickly in the interest of time, uh, we work with Fortune 500s. So, and others, sorry, not to, not to, not to say only Fortune 500, but at the end of the day, enterprises care about security, resiliency, and such. So all of the things I've mentioned are doable, but now you need to have a secure layer. So as I mentioned, we've built, we've built our product on Kubernetes. In Kubernetes, what Kubernetes lets you do is, is build your HA, your high availability strategy in any way you want to. So we've done that through the UI and you can deploy your nodes wherever and build as robust or not robust uh, solution as you want to. Key management, keys are essential for any blockchain solution. We are now integrated with some call, something called the hardware security model, module in which you can store your private keys in the most 
secure environment possible. And lastly, certificate management, as we've learned ourselves, is a very complex operation. So we've built the tooling for you to renew, manage, and such. Last point, boring but important, is certifications. You will work with a bank, you will need ISO and SOC 2. So we are ISO certified and we're going through SOC 2 now. I feel I've been running very quickly. So rather than run very quickly, I'm just going to caveat this and then I'm going to stop. We also participate in a number of other conversations as per Marta's question, we're looking at how to integrate identity. We're looking at interoperability from a perspective of how can many different frameworks work together, but we're also looking at how to move into the world of tokens. So tokens within Fabric, standardization of the taxonomy with the Interwork Alliance, but also how can we connect with public permission chains such as Hedera. So we wanted to have a conversation about the future. We have two minutes or three minutes. So rather than us talking about the future, what are any quick words and let's open it up for any questions. Now, I, given the time, let's let's hear what the, our esteemed guests have uh, for questions or thoughts on the future or what we've presented. Hello. Uh, uh, we are doing some projects with, hello, you, you hear me? Yep. Uh, we are doing some projects with uh, already with IBM Poland uh, for energy and uh, Everything you said there is important and it's uh, it's relevant. So uh, we appreciate the, the the cooperation with IBM, and we have already VIP treatment there. But uh, if you can give us a additional, uh, we will be very happy. I will send some information, some my email address, so we will be in contact. And uh, yeah. You, Lucas, you are in Warsaw or where are you? Uh, I'm in New York, but please uh, just email me and, and we're going to get on a separate call. Uh, I, of course, speak Polish, so napisz e maila i pogadamy dalej z teamem twoim. My współpracujemy bardzo, bardzo dobrze tutaj z ludźmi z IBM, z całym tym zespołem.